Hey everyone, thanks for checking out my 2019 Switch Retrospective. Because I'm not showing things one at a time anymore, I just like to show all this stuff that I got in my collection uh, at the beginning and end of the episodes, uh, and that way we can get through it quicker. Um, a ton of stuff this year, what a great year for Switch. Maybe, just like last year, I think the most exclusives of any console. Uh, PS4 exclusives dropping down, uh, and Switch exclusives really picking up. The Switch is killing it. Uh, new console this year, we got a new cool accessory to talk about. Um, bunch of really interesting stuff. So yeah, most of this stuff is physical exclusives for the Switch that came out in North America. Some of it, I mean, did come out on some other consoles, but there's a reason I'm including it here. Uh, if you haven't seen my previous retrospectives, go check them out. I do a bunch of consoles and I've done uh, the previous years of the Switch. So uh, yeah, lots of games you can learn about, check out. Uh, check out my multi-platform episodes. I don't have so many of those up, but I'm gonna keep working on those. And that covers stuff that came out on Switch, but also came out on other machines. So uh, great stuff to know about there. So yeah, let's just get going with the games. Uh, in the order they were released this year, here are the exclusives that I think are worth checking out for the Nintendo Switch in 2019. This year there were over 160 physical releases, including 57 exclusives by my count. That doesn't include limited release publisher games, so there's definitely more, it's just I don't really count those since they aren't easily accessible now. The first notable exclusive for the year is Fitness Boxing. Now this is actually a spiritual successor to the Wii game that was announced as Wii Exercise and released in Japan as Shape Boxing, then released in North America as Gold's Gym Cardio Workout. So a pretty interesting history for a game that you wouldn't expect to be that notable, but overall it's actually a decent kind of, you know, boxing exercise game uh, if that's the kind of thing you were into. Next up is New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe. Now, this includes both the original Wii U game and the Super Luigi U expansion. They now run at 1080p and 60 frames per second, so it looks a little bit better. And this includes the new character Toadette, along with her exclusive Super Crown power-up, which transforms her into Peachette, who can double jump, float, and survive falling in pits. So kind of easy mode for, I guess, kids who can't really uh, get through some of the tougher stages. Then we get Travis Strikes Again, No More Heroes. This No More Heroes spin-off has Badman tracking down Travis Touchdown to get revenge when both of them get sucked into a video game console. Gameplay is a top-down action game with light RPG elements that can be played co-op as well. You'll make your way through a series of different video game environments, taking down enemies using combat mechanics inspired from the main series, and find a ton of different skills to equip and use. A physical version included the DLC code for the Seasons Pass content, though if you're a big No More Heroes fan, you might want to consider importing the more recent PS4 release which includes all the content on disc. Overall, a game I think a lot of No More Heroes fans were looking forward to. Uh, it's a little repetitive, but still worth checking out. Then we get the physical release of Demo. Now this is the only retail release of the story-driven piano-style rhythm game that was previously released on other platforms by limited release publishers. This is by PM Studios, who does a lot of rhythm games, and uh, you know they have a focus on adding narrative into their games. We get to a couple games on this list by them, but definitely a creative take on this genre. Then we get to Sphinx and the Cursed Mummy. Now this is an unexpected remaster of a third person adventure game originally released in the PS2, Xbox, and GameCube era. It features improved graphics and sounds. Uh, the game has the player controlling the demigod Sphinx and his mummy sidekick to defeat enemies and solve puzzles. I never played the original uh, or this one yet, but it seemed to be praised for its interesting gameplay and narrative uh, for the time at least, so I hope to check this version out and see how that is and why it was worth remastering. Then we get Dragon Marked for Death, a 2D single plane side scrolling beat em up with a graphic style that resembles the Gun Vault games, which is also by this developer. The game has four different characters with unique attacks that can be played single player or four player co op through local or online play. This game includes all the DLC from the digital version that was released earlier, and the game has light RPG elements like quests and an equipment system to upgrade your stats. 
Shadow Edition of Aragami. Uh, this is a third-person stealth action game that was originally released physically on the PS4, but this Shadow Edition for the Switch contains all the DLC. Remilor, Lost Girl in the Lands is next. This is a top-down action-adventure roguelike hack-and-slash in which schoolgirl Remy and magical book lore are transported to a fantasy world under siege by mechs. Then we get Fun Fun Animal Park. This is a series of mini games that's only really notable for being published by Axis, so maybe better than it sounds. Uh, it has three modes with 30 motion controlled mini games for one or two players. Then Yoshi's Crafted World, the stylish follow up to Kirby's Epic Yarn. This takes the art style from Epic Yarn, but works in gameplay and difficulty you can expect from the Yoshi series. It's a 2.5D platformer in which you can throw eggs into the foreground and background to hit objects that cause the environment to alter, so you can get through stages or find secrets by hitting different things. The game also includes amiibo support, which is becoming rare for Nintendo games. In this game, you can unlock a different costume for every amiibo you scan. Next is Super Dragon Ball Heroes World Mission. Now this is a home version of the Japanese arcade trading card games. These games are big in Japan where you go to an arcade but you use your cards that you buy uh, to play on the machine and battle other people. Uh, it's basically a Dragon Ball themed CCG but not based on any of the uh, trading card games that were released here. The game has all the arcade, single and multiplayer content as well as an extensive new single player story mode. Neo Atlas 1469 is next. This is the fourth game in the Neo Atlas series, though only the first one we've gotten here, so that's why I never heard of it before. Uh, it's actually a remake, apparently, of Neo Atlas 2. It's a naval simulation game with a unique focus. In the game, you try to build a map of the world by sending out your admirals, and then when they come back with information, you have to decide what's worth including and what they might be wrong about. That affects how your map ends up. Uh, the game features exploration and fleet management and uses a more simplified structure than the traditional Japanese exploration sims that makes it easier to enjoy, but may not have as much depth for fans of that genre. The latest addition to the Labo line, we get the Nintendo Labo Toy-Con 4, the VR kit. Now this fourth Labo set is actually the most interesting in my opinion. With all the different high-end expensive VR options out there for PC and PS4, Nintendo releases something more akin to Google Cardboard. The kit includes the goggles and a blaster gun you put together. After putting your Switch in the goggles, you can hold it to your head by holding the attached Joy-Cons, or you can attach it to the blaster gun and hold that. The goggles themselves are actually kind of reminiscent of the Virtual Boy in that way. There's also a second version of the kit, which includes those, as well as a bird, foot pedal, camera, and elephant arm. Each of those are sold separately apparently, although I've never seen them at retail, as the Toy-Con VR Expansion Set 1, Camera and Elephant, and Toy-Con VR Expansion Set 2, Bird and Wind Pedal. The cart includes tools to build your own VR games, so you can make your own mini games, or you could check out the over 60 games created by Nintendo that are on the cart as well. Each of those games come with the project files, so you can study how they were put together when learning to make your own. Nintendo has also updated some of their games to include VR kit support in different ways. Super Mario Odyssey includes three new missions from existing locations for a short VR experience. Zelda Breath of the Wild lets you experience the whole game in VR. You can turn it on and off at any point while playing. Captain Toad Treasure Tracker lets you play four of its levels in VR. And Super Smash Bros. lets you play or watch single player matches with up to four characters through VR. Overall, it's a pretty cool experience and worth checking out if you're a big Nintendo fan. Then we get to Citus Alpha. An updated version of the rhythm game previously released digitally on mobile phones and Vita. The game is a rhythm game mixed with a narrative experience that takes place in a futuristic world where robots store human emotions as music. This version features over 200 tracks.
Then Broken Sword 5, The Serpent's Curse. This includes both episodes of the kickstarted latest entry in the Broken Sword adventure game series. It takes place after Broken Sword 4, The Angel of Death, which was the only game in the series that never got any console release. The Serpent's Curse sees George and Nicole meet up again while investigating a stolen painting, only to get wrapped up in a plot involving art theft and insurance scams. That sounds pretty boring, but actually these games are really interesting throwbacks to you know 80s movies and things like that. Definitely worth checking out if you're into point and click adventures. The game returns to a 2D visual style that offers two inventory systems you can choose from depending on which you preferred from the previous games. While only the Switch version was released in the US, there's also a PS4 import version just worth mentioning. This War of Mine is a unique take on the survival genre, being a 2D side-scroller set during a war in which you control a civilian trying to survive long enough to keep your group alive until a ceasefire is called. The original PC game was updated with an anniversary edition, a new storyline called The Little Ones, and three DLC episodes, The Father's Promise, The Last Broadcast, and Fading Embers. As far as console releases go, we only got a digital standalone release of The Little Ones for PS4 and Xbox One. But this Nintendo Switch release contains all the previously released content, making it the version to get if you're into this survival game. The main gameplay loop is a day-night cycle where you build up your base, manage your group and your resources during the day, and go out at night to search for supplies like food, water, medicine, and things to use in crafting and upgrading your base. You also have encounters with different NPCs out there, which can sometimes help you and sometimes hurt you. Each survivor has their own unique skills which you'll need including combat abilities because stealth and combat are necessary to stay alive when you leave your base. It's a really heavy game in terms of its uh, themes and concept. It's a really desperate struggle in a war-torn area that's pretty rough, so uh, not for uh, people who just want happy fun games, but definitely something worth checking out. Then Crystal Crisis, which is Nicalis's take on the Puzzle Fighter series. We see characters from their game Cave Story, and a number of guests like Isaac from Binding of Isaac who take on each other in gem dropping puzzle gameplay in order to unleash attacks. This includes several single player modes as well as local and online play. Then we get Little Friends, Dogs and Cats. Now this is a quick mention for an average pet simulation game that's trying to fill the gap Nintendo's leaving with no sequel to Nintendo Dogs and Cats. I don't think it's probably that good, but you know, if you're really into that genre, something worth knowing about. Then we get Opus Collection, which includes the two indie narrative adventure games that were digitally released on the Switch, The Day We Found Earth and Rocket of Whispers. In The Day We Found Earth, you play as a robot searching the universe through a telescope for Earth by following clues to identify similar planets. The story unfolds as you complete your scans, and you know, it's a pretty touching tale. In Rocket of Whispers, you go out into a top-down post-apocalyptic winter wasteland to scavenge for items to craft different upgrades with the goal of building a rocket. Both games seem simple at first, but at their core are emotional stories that are worth checking out if you're into narrative indie games like this. A game I didn't think we'd get over here, but I'm glad we did, Collection of Mana. The long-awaited official English release of the SNES game Seiken Densetsu 3, now officially titled Trails of Mana in English. It releases in this as part of the three-game retro collection, which also includes the original Game Boy game Final Fantasy Adventure and the SNES version of Secret of Mana. Still a pretty amazing collection for Mana fans, but I think it would have been cool if they included the other two versions of Densetsu 1, the Game Boy version called Sword of Mana and the Vita version called Adventures of Mana. Then Super Mario Maker 2, a great release for those who never got to experience how amazing the Wii U release was. Like the original game, you can use the tools provided to create your own Mario stages and share them with your friends, as well as play stages that others have created and shared. Stages can be built in the style of Super Mario Bros, Mario Bros 3, Super Mario World, New Super Mario Bros, and new to this release, Super Mario 3D Land. The game features a new single player mode where players complete challenges in order to help rebuild the princess's castle. Yeah, overall, it's a good tool and still a great experience, but the lack of improvements to the online feature set that make sharing and discovering levels easier really hurt the user experience. 
And interestingly enough, if you don't know, they added Link as a playable character later on with his own moveset, which is a neat addition and it would be great to see more updates like that. Next up is Senran Kagura Peach Ball. The lewd ninja high school girls of the Senran Kagura series return in another strange spin-off. This time they're transformed into half animal girls and have to be cured by playing games of pinball for some silly reason. Uh, you know, if you're into this series and probably who cares why it makes sense, it just is what it is. The game features a campaign mode with visual novel style segments and two different pinball tables including Peachland and Spooky Shinobi Park. There's also a diorama, dress up, and intimacy modes that the series is kind of known for at this point. So you probably know if you're into this series or not if this is a game for you. Then we get Umihara Kawase Fresh. This is the latest game in the not very well known Japanese platformer series starring the female chef Kawase. The game takes place in the Kingness Town which seems to have some connection to Kwase. Taking a delivery and cooking job, she can explore the town and caverns below as well as the floating castle above to learn about the area's strange happenings. Your main tool is the versatile fishing lure, which can be used for combat, traversal, and to solve puzzles. The game includes 75 quests, recipes to collect and cook, and unlockable alternate playable characters. Then we get to Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3 The Black Order. A VGA 2018 announcement surprise. It was revealed that this follow-up to the previous Marvel Ultimate Alliance and kind of X-Men Legend games was going to be a Nintendo exclusive. The game ignores the canon of the previous entries and features an original story about Thanos and the Black Order trying to collect all the Infinity Stones. The game includes 40 playable characters from different Marvel comics with over 10 additional characters added through DLC later. The RPG elements in the game have been toned down from the previous titles, but characters can still level up with experience, equip different crystals for stat increases and unlock skills. The top-down beat-em-up style combat has more of a focus on syncing abilities to synergize special attacks. Then Fire Emblem Three Houses. The latest Fire Emblem game sees the series popularity continue to skyrocket by expanding on the structure and concepts of the previous game and offering a staggering amount of content for fans. The game takes place on the continent of Fodland and centers around the Garag Mac Monastery a training school where the continent's three rival nations learn and train together. As a former mercenary, son of a hero, and the new professor at the school, you can choose one of the three houses to join and teach their students. This has the game's story branch into three completely different paths, each with minor decisions that affect the story and one with a major decision that completely changes things up again. That makes for four very different scenarios to experience for hardcore fans who can dedicate the time to see them all. Gameplay involves the turn-based combat systems the series is known for. A new feature to the battle system is the ability to hire battalions that support characters by providing various buffs and gambit abilities. The biggest change from the previous battle systems is that the rock paper scissors weapon triangle is gone. Instead, now different combat arts can be learned which alter how a character's equipped weapon performs against other weapon types. For much of the game, outside of battle you spend your time teaching and socializing at the monastery. You get a specific amount of time between each mission to perform different activities, as well as spending time with your students and recruiting students from other houses if you can. The dating aspects are far toned down from the previous games, likely because the teacher-student power dynamic would make for some very controversial moments if it was handled like previous games. Overall a massive amount of tactics here. Uh, if you're into these kinds of games, or if you're into Fire Emblem, then you definitely need to play it. Then enter the Gungeon. A cult hit indie top-down roguelike dungeon crawler with 8 playable characters and over 300 guns. In the game, the player takes on the role of a Gungeoneer, an adventurer with a past full of regret who enters the dungeon to find the mystical gun that can kill the past. It's a fun world full of interesting stories, characters, enemies, and frantic gunplay. The player moves through the randomly generated floors of the dungeons, kicking over tables for cover, dodging, and taking out enemies and bosses, as well as finding tons of new guns to try out. If the player manages to escape the dungeon during a run, they can use their treasure to buy permanent increases and make their next runs easier. There have been limited release versions of this game on other platforms, but only this Switch version was available widely at retail. Then we get to Yu-Gi-Oh! Legacy of the Duelist Link Evolution. This port of the 2015 cross-platform title is a great way to experience the Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG. 
Being on the Switch makes it a great portable title and perfect for playing against your friends. The game features different campaigns for each of the different Yu-Gi-Oh! anime series that make up a ton of single player content where you repeat the battles from the shows. The game has all the DLC packs from the previous version, making for over 9,000 cards. And while this version was a Switch exclusive for a while, Konami just announced that an updated version will be released for other platforms this year, with these same updates coming to Switch as well later. So this is technically only exclusive for 2019. Uh, at some point it won't be anymore, but yeah, it was for a while. Then we get Astral Chain. Platinum brings their first original title to the Switch with gameplay that mixes things up quite a bit. The game stars a special police force who take on the strange chimera monsters that enter their world through gates from another dimension. The only weapon powerful enough to stop them is a legion, which is basically a chimera that has been chained through technology and tied to a user. You can choose to play a male or female character, both of whom are the adopted twins of the game's Captain Max. Combat is an interesting mix of a slightly pared down version of the standard Platinum character action combat along with commanding your legion at the same time. Your character can switch between their melee weapon and firearms to attack, and can dodge enemy attacks, which if done at the right time, has the game go into slow mode for a couple seconds, similar to Bayonetta's Witch Time. You can also call out your legion, send it to attack, and pull it back. You can also take direct control of it to move it into positions, and once it's in position, it'll attack any nearby enemies. By moving it around, there's also some neat maneuvers you can do based on its positioning. You can wrap its chain around enemies to tie them down, or kind of create a sling to fling enemies away. Outside of combat, there are investigation scenes where you can use your AR tools to investigate the scenes where chimeras have attacked, and use different abilities to find collectibles or solve side missions in the environment. All in all, it's a very different experience worth checking out. Like most Platinum games, it's accessible but tough to master. Though for those who really don't care for the difficult combat, there's easy modes which claim to make things easy enough for anyone to see the whole story. Then we get Damon X Machina. From the producer of Armored Core 2 and 3 and the mech designer from Macross, which was also the first season of Robotech over here, comes this new mech combat game. The game puts the player in control of a highly customizable mech as they take on various missions to protect the Earth from robots controlled by a corrupted AI. The story takes place in a world where the moon exploded and pieces of it landed on the planet, releasing a strange radiation that infected the AI and also gave pilots the ability to control these super high speed mechs. Aside from the single player campaign, there's also a second set of co-op missions that can be played by four players by connecting their switches locally or online. Gameplay is pretty much just an amped up version of Armored Core. It's a fast paced third person mech shooter where you can use all kinds of different weapons to take out your enemies. It's not a genre for everyone, but if you like customizing your mech and taking it into battle, games like that, this is definitely worth a look. Next up is Star Wars Pinball. Originally a digital Wii U release with only three tables, this pinball collection from the developers of Zen Pinball and Pinball FX have updated their offering for the Switch with all the previous DLC. So now the game features 19 tables based on different Star Wars TV, film, and character moments. There's a single player campaign mode for those who need their pinball to have a progression pass through the tables, and a challenge mode to check out as well. And over here now, we're going to talk about the Switch Lite. This came out in at least three different colors. I think later there may have been some exclusive colors that released alongside uh, Pokemon Sword and Shield. Uh, but yeah, this is a cheaper, smaller option. One I predicted quite a while ago. Uh, it's a smart way to upgrade your 3DS. You know, 3DS is pretty much dead this year. Uh, check out the 3DS retrospective that'll be up soon for this year to see just how dead it really is. But yeah, um, a great system for people who don't want to play on the TV but if you do want to play you know every multiplayer game and every experience on the Switch and if you do want to play on the TV uh, you know it's better for multiplayer that way some games anyway uh, yeah you really don't want this uh, this is our second Switch so it kind of made sense um, to check it out but it's yeah you can't dock it to the TV like you, there's never gonna as far as we know, there's not even the hardware in there to do video out, so uh, any kind of dock they do put out would probably be way more expensive than the regular dock. And you can pair other Joy-Cons to it, but, um, you know, that you, your mileage is going to vary when you can't output to a TV. Also, the screen is much smaller, which is great for portability, but also not so great for games that are really hard to read in handheld mode. I know uh, there's some offenders, I think, uh, Fire Emblem was a huge offender when it came out. It may have been patched, but definitely some other games haven't been patched that are going to be tough to read on that smaller screen. So just know what you're getting into. Um, yeah.
And then we get The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening. The update to the original Link's Awakening, which was a Game Boy 2D Zelda game, and the Game Boy Color's DX version. It's very faithful to the original game, bringing a cult classic entry in the series to a new generation of players. The story is pretty much exactly the same, but the graphics have been remade in a new toy art style that's pretty divisive amongst fans. A big but seemingly minor change to the gameplay is that with more buttons available, you don't need to constantly switch what's equipped, so that makes it quite a bit easier to play. There's also a bunch of extra collectibles and some new ones, including empty bottles, statues based on Mario enemies, and dungeon tiles which tie into the new dungeon builder mode. Which itself is the biggest addition to the game, but also the biggest letdown. While this could have been an interesting Zelda dungeon maker, uh, it's so limited that it's literally impossible to do anything creative or interesting in it. Some collectibles are locked behind its frustrating challenges too. The core game is still amazing, still worth checking out if you've never played uh, this game. The story is really cool, the characters are amazing, it's got a very cool vibe. Uh, overall, a ton of fun and a great update to that original experience. Uh, just don't go in expecting anything that resembles Breath of the Wild or even any previous 3D Zelda game and you should be happy. Next is a collection called Trine Series 1, 2, 3. These are puzzle platformers that are kind of like Lost Vikings but not quite, where you control three characters with unique abilities to get through the stages. The first two games are 2.5D, while the third game is 3D, which changes up the gameplay a fair bit and ended up disappointing fans so much that the developers apologized for it. Now you might think that this physical version is on all consoles, but this is the only console physical release of the first three games where they're included on the cart. Even if you got the full collection with Trine 4 for the Switch, uh, those games are only included as a download code, so you have to buy this uh, 1, 2, 3 version separate if you want the games on the cartridge. Next up is Fishing Star World Tour. This is a fishing game for those who enjoy the genre, but want a less simulation-like experience. The game features 40 locations, 70 lures, and over 180 fish to catch using the Joy-Con motion controls. There's also some mini-games, including a trolling game designed to be played with a Labo fishing rod controller. Next is Dragon Quest XI S, Echoes of an Exclusive Age Definitive Edition. This edition brings a number of updates to the game, including a new retro style mode, which you can switch to in order to experience the game in a classic sprite-based mode. It changes up the game a ton. It almost feels like a fan demake of the original game, so it's very cool to check out. A big retro-only feature that's added to the game is the new world of Tickington, which builds out as you meet specific characters in the game, and has a bunch of callbacks to past Dragon Quest titles. There's also a new speed option to let you power through the battles more quickly, as well as a new photo mode, new voiceovers, and the option to play with the orchestral soundtrack, which was a bit of a deal when the PS4 version came out for some licensing rights that we don't understand. There's also new side quests specific to your party members and new marriage options, as well as a ton of other minor changes. Even if you played the original, if you were a big fan and never wanted to go back to it, they added a bunch here and it's definitely worth checking out. Which brings us to Burger Time Party. The latest entry to the Burger Time series takes the burger building action puzzle gameplay of the original titles and increases the scope. Like the previous games, you run along platforms that hold the ingredients in order to drop them down until a burger is completed, all while avoiding obstacles and enemies. Stages are bigger and include a number of new hazards, as well as some puzzle mechanics to mix up the original gameplay formula. It has over 100 stages and also features 4-play co-op. There's also a new battle mode where three players control enemies going after the main player. Next is Gun Gun Pixies. This is a lewd third person shooter that puts the player in control of two mini sized alien girls who are sent to Earth to learn more about humans. And to do so, they visit a girl's dorm to complete different objectives that all revolve around shooting the girls with happiness bullets that, well, let's say gives them pleasure. There's short visual novel style segments that let you learn more about the dorm's inhabitants and the alien pixies, but everything about the game is really going for that edgy vibe, where even for me I think crosses the line into creepy quite a bit. It's just an extreme take on that typical lewd anime comedy humor, which you really have to dig in order to enjoy the writing here. As the pixies, your clothes break apart when you take damage from the girl's bad feelings which manifest as energy and come after you. You can also collect coins to buy upgrades, including different costumes and lingerie to equip. 
It's a pretty rough game, so it's really only players who are really into this style of over-the-top anime fan service. Controls aren't that great. Um, it could have been something special. I thought it'd be something a little more akin to Galgun, which is different take on the same idea. But I think it just needed a lot more polish to appeal to anyone else. Then we get a hat in time. A kickstarted 3D platformer that takes inspiration from Nintendo 64 style platformers and apparently seems to hit the mark closer than other recent attempts. The game stars Hat Girl, a space traveler who refuses to pay a toll to the Mafia at a planet she's passing by and decides to team up with the locals to fight against them. The game includes five open world levels that have various objectives for the player to complete in order to find and earn a number of time pieces. Power-ups include hats that give the player different abilities, which can be crafted by finding different yarn balls in the stages. Other collectibles include coins that can be used to purchase upgrades for your hat abilities, relics which unlock new challenges, and rift tokens which can be used to unlock extra bonus content. Another collection, Digimon Story Cyber Sleuth Complete Edition. This is a compilation of the two Digimon Cyber Sleuth games which were released on the PS4 and Vita and which were follow-ups to the Digimon Story series which had four DS entries. It includes Digimon Story Cyber Sleuth and Digimon Story Cyber Sleuth Hacker's Memories, which are much more traditional JRPGs than the digital monster catching and raising focus gameplay of the Digimon World series. So more narrative here, more mystery, uh, more JRPG turn-based combat. It's a very JRPG game for fans of Digimon. And the other new piece of hardware way down here, kind of the spiritual successor to Wii Fit, um, is this Ring Fit adventure game that came out. And this thing is a pretty neat idea. I hope they come out with more games to support this, but this game is pretty cool. Let's talk about it for a bit. Then a big release, one that's sold out right now for various reasons and tough to find, Ring Fit Adventure. Nintendo's next exercise focused title is much more of a game than their previous attempts and makes for a compelling experience by layering in RPG elements and adding a world full of Nintendo charm. After unleashing an evil bodybuilding dragon that was trapped in a mystical ring, the player gets superpowers to fight back. Along with Ring, they take on a series of quests to level up and defeat that dragon, all by doing exercises. The game ships with a leg strap that one Joy-Con goes into and Nintendo's take on a Pilates ring that holds the second Joy-Con. The ring can be moved, turned, squeezed, and stretched to perform different actions. There's a ton of different gameplay here. Compared to any other exercise game that's come before, they've done a great job of gamifying, uh, you know, working out. The game is basically a mix of an exercise title, a 3D action platformer, and an RPG. In the 100 level story mode, there are a couple different mission types. The main one has you running through stages, which feature multiple paths, how you clear different obstacles depends on how fast and how you move your legs. You can also aim and push in the ring to jump, glide, or fire blasts. You can also pull in the ring to suck up coins along the way. There's also turn-based battles you get into where you can learn and perform over 40 different skills. Basically, you're just doing reps of a specific exercise or yoga pose and that attacks the enemies. And then you defend against that enemy's attacks and you basically just have to do it enough times to take them out. Aside from the main story mode, there's also quick play exercises and mini games. If you can find it, this is highly recommended if you're the type of person who needs motivation to exercise or just don't have a very active lifestyle. Then into the Dead 2. A port of a mobile auto runner FPS set during a zombie outbreak. The game features a 60 stage story mode with 36 extra side missions. Unlockables include 25 weapons and 8 animal companions. This game is interesting, but generally considered pretty mediocre and tedious, even by fans of the first game. Another big Nintendo hit for the year, Luigi's Mansion 3. Finally, the series returns to consoles after a 3DS remake and sequel. The game sees Mario and company lured to a haunted hotel before everyone but Luigi is captured by ghosts. Luckily for him, his ghost busting equipment is nearby so he can clear the hotel of ghosts and rescue his friends. The game structure requires Luigi to explore the 17 floors of the hotel which each has a different theme. The elevator can only go to certain floors, forcing Luigi to explore the floors available for different passages to other floors to find elevator buttons which eventually open up new areas. Gameplay wise, you've got the same tools as before but there's a number of new ways you can use them. The flashlight weakens ghosts, but you can also use it to search for hidden objects. 
Aside from just sucking up ghosts, the vacuum can also be used to fire plungers or launch Luigi into the air. The game brings in Gooigi, who was introduced in the 3DS remake of the GameCube game. This time you can take control of the goo-based clone and use him to access areas regular Luigi can't reach. He can also be controlled by a second player through co-op play. Lastly, the game includes two online 8-player multiplayer modes, the Scare Scraper co-op mode returns from Dark Moon, where players work together to clear out the floors of a randomly generated building. The competitive Screen Park mode features several 4-on-4 team-based matches in which it's Luigi's versus Gooigi's. Overall, a great new entry in the series, though the controls feel a bit awkward until you try out all the options and get used to the one that suits you best. Then we get Mario and Sonic at the Olympics Games, Tokyo 2020. The sixth Mario and Sonic at the Olympics game uh, once again features Mario and Sonic characters taking part in the Tokyo Summer Olympics in 2020, which at this point is uh, slightly more interesting because we're not sure if the Tokyo Olympics is going to happen, uh, you know, due to the coronavirus outbreak. If you're watching this some years down the line, yeah, it was a concern that uh, lots of events were being canceled. This was a big deal. Hopefully we're all still alive. The game includes 30 events to take part in, including some new to the series. There's also fantastical dream events, which are more over the top than the standard mini games. And the biggest new feature is a story mode that has the player taking part in 10 retro style events during the Tokyo 1964 Olympics. Next is Disney Sum Sum Festival. Mostly just for Disney fans, this minigame collection based on the Disney Sum Sum toy line has four player co-op and competitive games, alongside a single player offering. Games include curling, a maze chase game, a roller coaster ride, a top spinning like battle game, an isometric style 3D platformer race, a carnival style shooting game, carnival style shooting game, a sci-fi themed carnival style shooting gallery, tabletop hockey inspired games, and one of those attraction center games where you shoot coins and try to get more coins to drop. There's also a rhythm game and a bubble pop and puzzle mode. The main goal of the game is to earn coins to unlock new characters which can be used then in the mini game. So you're basically just building up your Sum Sum collection. Next is Layton's Mystery Journey, Cottrell and the Millionaire's Conspiracy. This is a port of the 3DS title that sees Professor Layton's daughter, Catrell Layton, searching for her lost father while helping the cops solve strange crimes around town and build up her own detective agency. Originally designed for mobile, the game is much more focused on its puzzles than narrative compared to the previous games. There's 12 different cases with their own mystery to solve, offering over 400 puzzles, and the game ends on a bit of a cliffhanger, so that's a bit of a shame, uh, worth knowing if you're about to get into it. Then we get New Super Lucky's Tale, a port of the previously Xbox exclusive mascot platformer. New Super Lucky's Tale is a 3D platformer starring the fox Lucky, who's trying to protect a magical book from the evil cat Jinx. The original version of this game, which in itself was a sequel to a VR title, was pretty heavily criticized in its original Xbox release. But in the Switch version, they fixed a lot of the issues, improving the camera, UI, animations, and more, and it's been received quite a bit better. The big changes include a new slide ability and several new stages. If, so if you're looking for another family-friendly 3D platformer, this is worth a look now. Next up is My Friend Pedro. An update of an Adult Swim Flash game that was originally released in 2014. The game is a 2D action game with a focus on stylish shooting using time slowing mechanics to pull off crazy flips and bullet dodging spins. You can also kick enemies and objects, aim your second gun separately while one is locked onto targets so you can shoot both at once, and do all kinds of other tricks to pull off cool kills. The game features a number of different environments to shoot your way through as well as some gameplay mix up that introduce vehicles and chase sequences. Overall, a fun game to play through and one that's really rewarding when you can pull off a great chain of stylish kills. It's also worth noting that this did get a limited release through, I believe, Special Reserve Games. That includes a more patched version of the game, but yeah, you had to wait a lot longer for that one since my version only came in March of 2020. Next up is Pokemon Sword and Shield. These were released individually or as a two-pack. These are the controversial first full Pokemon games on the Switch. 
they pretty much improve on everything from the previous titles and add in a ton of new features, but they pared back the full Pokedex to only 400, which is about half the list of full Pokemon. The game takes place in the new Galar region, which is inspired by the UK. Here the player controls a kid who's from the same hometown as the current Pokemon League's top trainer Leon. So alongside Leon's brother, you set out to learn about Pokemon, catch and train them, and explore the world to become a Pokemon master like always. There's tons of adventure and mystery to experience in the world, gyms to battle through, another evil organization who is trying to mess things up, and just the typical stuff you kind of know if you've played a Pokemon game before. The game introduced over 80 new Pokemon and 13 new Galar region variants. Gameplay is pretty much the same as the previous games, but there's a ton of minor quality of life improvements and several big additions. One nice touch is that you can now see Pokemon running around before you battle them. So instead of having random encounters, you can avoid fights for Pokemon that you already have too many of or just don't care about. The biggest addition though is the inclusion of Dynamaxing and Gigamaxing, where certain Pokemon can go all Kaiju and become massive for battles. Another really important addition is the open wild area where you can camp, find tons of different Pokemon, take part in co-op raids, and there's different ways to interact with your Pokemon there, like going to a camp where you can cook and play with them. You can also put them to work at different Poke jobs throughout the game. Despite the lower number of Pokemon, the game has a ton of content worth checking out. And if you haven't played a Pokemon game in several generations, it's the perfect time to get back in. Next is Instant Sports. Another mediocre attempt to fill the need for a Wii Sports game uh, this generation. Since Nintendo won't release a follow-up to that, uh, the game features six sports that can be played solo or multiplayer, including tennis, soccer, shootout, bowling, baseball, rafting, and the hurdle race. Again, not a great game, but if you're really hankering for a Wii Sports-like thing, this is another option. And Waku Waku Sweets. An update to the digital only 3DS cooking game that features over 100 recipes to make while interacting and building relationships with the various townsfolk through its story mode. The last game of the year is non exclusive, but I'm still bringing it up because it's special to me Deadly Premonition Origins. Basically, a port of the PS3's. Deadly Premonition Director's Cut, so not exclusive, but really notable because Deadly Premonition 2 was announced as a Switch exclusive, so I'll take any reason to play this game again. It's a really rough game, but there's something really special about it, especially for Twin Peaks fans. I'm super excited for the Switch exclusive Deadly Premonition 2, so so I gotta hype it up here. And that's all the notable stuff, but you know what, because I've covered so much, even some titles that really didn't need to be in there, I'm just going to finish it off by going through the other exclusives this year. Uh, really quickly, some things worth mentioning. Uh, we got the Air Conflicts, Pacific Carriers, and Secret Wars collection. So these games have been released separately or t on different consoles, but I don't think they've been released in this combination. Uh, we got Saints Row the Third, the full package. To support of maybe the best Saints Row game, uh, Farm Expert 2019 for people who care, Gear Club Unlimited 2 Porsche Edition, uh, Zumba Burn It Up Fitness Game, Farming Simulator 20, and the Assassin's Creed Rebel Collection, which includes Black Flag and Rogue. So yeah, before we wrap this up, the last two games I had them lying down on the table, you probably couldn't see them. The first was a Shovel Knight Treasure Trove. Now this is not an exclusive game, it came out for everything, but there were some exclusive amiibos that came out for it for exactly. Uh, so that makes it kind of neat, some exclusive features there, but I'm going to cover those in a separate video. I think I might start doing an amiibo series, I'm a big amiibo collector, so yeah, we'll get into that then. And then was uh, Tokyo School Life which is a visual novel game that was exclusively put out by VGP, uh, Video Games Plus in Canada. There were a lot of releases this year that were limited run games by different limited run companies for the Switch. And I usually don't cover those because like, it's not really fair to uh, list these games that aren't available at retail that you have to pre-order or not even pre-order. Sometimes you just have to get it within the hour it releases. Limited run games specifically has been doing mostly pre-orders now though, so they are kind of worth covering. You still really can't pick them up after release, but you sometimes find them around. It's actually a lot easier to find them around than I had ever expected. Uh, and the pre-order stuff is just they take as many pre-orders as they can and make it. So as long as you're following them before the game comes out, you're still pretty easy to get a lot of this stuff. 
Uh, so I'm going to cover that in a separate video as well. I'm going to start doing limited run stuff for all the different limited publishers. Uh, so yeah, stay tuned for that stuff. And yeah, that's it for my 2019 Switch retrospective. I hope you learned about a bunch of games that you maybe didn't know about. Uh, check out my multi-platform, like I said. Check out my other videos if you have other consoles you want to learn about. And stay tuned for more Switch and other content coming up. Like and subscribe if you learned anything from this video and found it helpful. That really helps, you know, in a lot of ways. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye. And just one last thing, uh, if you stuck around this long, I'm not going to make any more Wii or Wii U retrospectives because, you know, it's just not worth it. But if you're watching Switch, you're probably interested in Nintendo stuff in general. And uh, yeah, some games did come out for those two systems in the years since I finished those systems uh, in my retrospective series. So these Just Dance titles, you can still pick them up. Just Dance 2020 available on the Wii, Wii U, Switch, just everything else. Um, you know, the years before that, yeah, I they think they said this was going to be the last year for those old systems, but we'll see. I'm not sure who's playing those. I'm sure there's hospitals or retirement homes or someone keeps buying those. Uh, they've got some kind of recurring order on that. I have no idea, but yeah, that's interesting. It's appreciation time! Reward Mike's hard work by subscribing. Otherwise, we might see you in the next class trial. <laughs>